In our first video, we talked about what makes up gastric juices, and we saw that mucus from the mucus cells and the mucus neck cells are going to protect the stomach's lining. Um, from what, right? Well, it's a pH of two. It could dissolve the cells, and there's these protein enzymes that are getting activated that can eat the proteins of the cells. So pretty much to protect you from digesting yourself. And then pepsinogen is this um, major component released by chief cells that has to be activated. And once hydrochloric acid comes into contact with the pepsinogen, it becomes a new form of this enzyme called pepsin, where it is active, and it can break down your proteins into you know, smaller pieces called polypeptides. And then the hydrochloric acid is released by these parietal cells, and that's, of course, what gives the acidic conditions that the pepsin can work in. And then you have enteroendocrine cells that are releasing um, hormones and help regulate digestion, and then intr intrinsic factors that are uh, needed for vitamin B absorption later in the small intestines. So when you look at the mucosa, it's super thick inside the stomach, and it's bedazzled, if you will, with all these gastric pits. And these gastric pits are the holes on top of a gastric gland. And so if you look at this gland, you can see all these cells. So we are simple columnar epithelial, one layer of columnar shaped cells. And towards the neck, you have these mucus cells, which is why they're calling them mucus neck cells. So we're going to, you know, secrete a bunch of mucus out of this gland your parietal cells, chief cells, and interendocrine cells are all down here. So we're making hydrochloric acid, we're making pepsin, um, or pepsinogen, and then we're releasing um, hormonal control over pretty much the, the, the parietal cells. So if you look closer, these are closer deep, like deeper into this gland. And um, if you look, these chief cells are releasing the pepsinogen. The parietal cells, they're scary looking, right? So that helps me remember that they release the hydrochloric acid. And that hydrochloric acid breaks pepsinogen down into pepsin, which is that active form of protein, uh, active form of enzyme to break down or digest protein. So we are digesting protein in the stomach. We digested um, starch in the mouth with amylase, um, and now we're here in the stomach finally digesting some protein. If you put meat in your mouth and let it sit around for a long time, it's not changing because you don't have enzymes to break the meat down. Uh, it's not until the stomach does that start happening. So gastric juice is produced <coughs> continuously, but the rates can uh, varies considerably, and it's controlled by both neurally and hormonally um, processes. So in the gastric glands, the specialized interendocrine cells are closely associated, like I mentioned, nearby the parietal cells, and they're um, secreting hormones, specifically somatostatin, and this is going to stop the hydrochloric acid from being um, secreted. So this is a way of negative feedback. Um, another thing that's going to decrease gastric activity is the sympathetic impulses. And so I think of, right, sympathetic as fight or flight. You don't really need to digest anything when you're trying to save your life. So this, that sympathetic impulse, it shuts that gastric activity down. On the, on the flip side, if you're resting and relaxing, you can digest your parasympathetic impulses are going to increase all that. Uh, gastrin is also inc increased in gastric juice um, secretion. And... It says uh, the parasympathetic impulses also stimulate the interendocrine cells, mainly the pyloric region, and it releases this peptide hormone gastrin. This increases the secretory activity of all your gastric glands. Gastrin stimulates cell division in your mucosa and your, of your stomach and intestines, and that helps also replace um, cells that have been damaged due to um, just normal function because this is a dangerous place your cells are hanging out in, or maybe disease or even like medicines you've taken that have done damage. And then um, parasympathetic impulses and the gastrin promote release of uh, a paracrine called histamine, 
and that also stimulates additional gastric secretions. They occur in three stages, cephalic, gastric, and intestinal phases, and um, these are based on what controls the stomach, the brain, the stomach itself, and the intestines. And so um, this is just a picture of the regulation of the secretion. So impulses con conducted by your parasympathetic uh, preganglionic nerve fiber. Um, so we're talking about the vagus nerve is stimulating the, mus uh, the, the stomach. And then parasympathetic postganglionic impulses stimulate the release of these gastric juices from the glands. And these impulses stimulate the release of gastrin into your bloodstream, and that in turn stimulates the glands to release more gastric um, juice. Not a big deal, but kind of interesting. And then, as I mentioned, the three phases, the cephalic phase, the gastric phase, and the intestinal phase. So what are they talking about? The cephalic phase begins before food even reaches the stomach, and maybe even before eating. It could be just the sight, the smell, the thought of food is going to start triggering this. And gastric juice is secreted in response to that. In the gastric phase, um, this accounts for most of the secretory activity, and this is starts actually when food does enter the stomach. So the presence of the food and as the stomach starts to distend that wall, um, that triggers the release of gastrin and promotes more gastric juice. And as food mixes with all that, the pH of the contents rise and that enhances gastric secretion. Um, when that pH, uh, when the pH of the stomach content drops, um, will eventually drop. And uh, as it approaches like a 3.0 pH, the gastrin is inhibited. But when it gets back to about 1.5, sorry, when it reaches 1.5, the gastrin secretion um, actually stops. And then the intestinal phase of gastric secretion begins when the food leaves the stomach and enters the small intestine. And when the food first contacts and stretches the intestinal wall, it stimulates intestinal cells to secrete hormone, hormones that briefly enhance gastric gland secretion. So now we're going to talk about gastric absorption. As gastric enzymes begin breaking down these proteins, the stomach wall is not adapted to absorb anything. Uh, no, or I, I shouldn't say anything doesn't absorb very much at all. The stomach absorbs only small volumes of water, certain salts, and a few lipid-soluble drugs. Uh, most of the nutrients are going to be absorbed in the small intestine. Now, alcohol, that's not a nutrient. That's actually a waste product of um, fermentation, is absorbed both in the small intestine and in the stomach, and aspirin is also absorbed in the stomach. So add aspirin to your list of things, okay? So the mixing of food in the stomach with the gastric juices produces this paste we call chyme, and sometimes you'll hear it called acid chyme. And the peristaltic waves push that chyme toward the pylorus of the stomach, and as it accumulates near that pyloric sphincter, the sphincter begins to relax. And as your stomach contractions like push chyme just a little bit at a time into the small intestine, these peristaltic weights reach the distal stomach and the contractions push the stomach contents back towards the antrum, resulting in more mixing. The lower esophageal sphincter um, prevents the reflux. Remember the cardiac sphincter prevents reflux of stomach contents back into the esophagus. Um, as chyme enters the duodenum, accessory organs will add some secretions. We'll talk about that next. When the chyme starts to fill the duodenum, the stretch receptor receptors initiate what's called the enterogastric reflex, and this uh, slows the stomach emptying, um, and as the result of this, it, fewer parasympathetic impulses arrive at the stomach, and that decreases peristalsis, so this slows the stomach emptying and intestinal feeling. Oh my gosh, vomiting results from a complex reflex that empties the stomach in the reverse of what is the norm, right? It may be triggered by certain drugs or toxins in your contaminated food. Uh, it could be distension of your stomach, changes in your body motion, you know, like at the carnival, and other sensory impulses of your inner ear. You can get motion sickness. 
and it, but it's controlled by the vomiting center of the medulla oblongata. And so here's a picture of the stomach movements um, as our cardiac sphincter opens and allows food to enter the stomach. Um, we're going to have this peristaltic um, motion and movement to mix the food material into a paste called chyme. Notice our sphincters are closed, but as um, the sphincters relax, we'll start to release food, or this acid chyme, I should call it, into the duodenum. And this is showing what nerves um, control this. So one common problem is about heartburn. I always think of my son when I think about heartburn because um, our family was just going through a hard time and he was at church and Sunday school and they were talking about when somebody hurts your heart and like he raised his hand he wanted to share and they were on purpose not calling on him because they just knew like we were going through some tough stuff and maybe it was content that shouldn't be shared with the whole you know like three-year-old class but um my son was very persistent and finally they called him and he, he said, yes, I know all about when something hurts your heart because I have had heartburn. So I just think that's so cute. Um, so this can happen for a number of reasons. You can eat too quickly and, and the thing is you're supposed to eat slow, right? Because it takes some time for you to even your brain to recognize that you're full. Um, up to 20 minutes. So if you're full and you're still eating 20 minutes later, this is going to lead to some discomfort and perhaps some gastric reflux where you have that stomach content going into the esophagus past that pyloric sphincter. Um, it can cause inflammation called esophagitis um, and hurts your heart area. So it's called heartburn. And uh, they said, eat small meals, eat slowly, stay up right after you eat, avoid caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol, all the fun stuff. Now we're moving into the accessory organs of our digestive system. And the first one we talk about is the pancreas. And most people think that the pancreas is solely for um, insulin and glucagon, but it is a digestive organ and it secretes digestive fluids called pancreatic juices. So while it's an endocrine gland, it is also an exocrine gland making this pancreatic juice. So what's the juice? How, do we, how are we making this juice? So the pancreatic acinar cells make up most of the pancreas and they release this juice into tiny ducts that lead to the pancreatic duct. And the pancreatic duct, along with the bile duct from the liver and the gallbladder, all empty into the duodenum of the small intestine. So they, um, you don't need to really focus on this part, but this hepatopancreatic sphincter um, surrounds an ampulla, this area where the tube is dilated, where these kind of join together. And this controls the movement of bile and the pancreatic juices into the duodenum. So if you'll look, here is the pancreas and most of the cells, and here are all these tiny um, duct work, uh, accessory ducts, and they lead to this main pancreatic duct. And so as um, this digestive juices flow, they go usually here to this region. And so they've zoomed in on here, major duodenal papilla where this piece is, is indented in. And so here you can see the pancreatic duct and the bile duct are going to come together and then empties out into the lumen of the duodenum. So what is this juice? Um, it has a bunch of enzymes and they digest everything. So the pancreas is really important as far as a digestive organ. So we have pancreatic amylase. We saw amylase in our saliva. We called it sal salivary amylase. It still breaks down starch and glycogen into disaccharides. And so we're, you know, just because you chewed and you wet your food a little bit um, doesn't mean all the starch got broken down. So in the duodenum, in the small intestines, we're going to further break down the starch. Uh, like I'm thinking about when I eat my french fries. Oh my gosh, they're not even in my mouth for long. Like I am gobbling those things up. So very little starch is getting broken down. 
So we need to continue breaking that down for my energy in my small intestines. We also have pancreatic lipase, so that's breaking down the triglycerides, the, the fat molecules into um, their fatty acid components. We have trypsin, and this digests proteins. It is released as inactive trypsinogen. So this should sound like pepsin and pepsinogen. Um, and just that know that pepsin happens in the stomach where trypsin happens in the, in the intestine released by the pancreas. Uh, chymotrypsin digests proteins also. It's activated by trypsin. And then uh, carbo carboxypeptidase digests proteins and it's also activated by trypsin. Notice ACE tells you it's an enzyme. Peptid usually is referring to proteins. And so um, all these trypsin names are going to be protein digestions. So most protein, while it starts in the stomach, is really going to happen here in the small intestine. The nucleases, there's that ACE, an enzyme that breaks down nucleotides uh, or breaks nucleic acids into nucleotides like DNA and RNA. So hopefully you're eating things that contain DNA and RNA because you need the nucleotides to make your own DNA and RNA. Remember, you are what you eat. And then bicarbonate ions make the pancreatic juice alkaline. And so remember all of that stomach acid, that acid chyme is being released from the stomach uh, into our small intestine and we need to neutralize it quickly. So this is gonna be an alkaline solution so that when it mixes with the acid, it neutralizes. So hormones regulate the release of your pancreas. Uh, secretin and CCK again. Secretin, and it stimulates the pancreas to release those juices. And CCK uh, stimulates the pancreas to release those juices in high in enzymes. So uh, bicarbonate ions versus enzymes. And then you have a little bit of nervous system regulation. During that cephalic and gastric phases, those impulses will stimulate digestive enzymes to be released by the pancreas. So they're showing that acid chyme has just left our stomach, went through the sphincter right here in the duodenum. And then uh, the intestinal mucosa releases secretin into your bloodstream. That stimulates the duct cells um, to secrete the bicarbonate ions and then that passes down these ducts to the duodenum and helps neutralize the acid there. Our next accessory organ is the liver. It's the largest internal organ. If you ever have dissected anything, you know that liver takes up a lot of space. It's in the upper right abdomen. Um, it's right below the diaphragm. It's very pigmented because it's got all this vascular tissue associated with it. So the liver has four lobes, and I wouldn't have you focus on that at all, but um, each, the lobe consists of these other smaller lobes called lobules, and they are the functional units of the liver. So they contain, contain hepatocytes. Now, anytime you see hepat, like hepatitis is inflammation of the liver, hepat means liver, so these literally means liver cells. They are found around a central vein, and then you have some hepatic sinusoids, which are little channels. Um, oid means like, sinus is a space, so little space-like places in the liver. And then you have a portal vein that brings absorbed nutrients to this, these little spaces. And of course, an artery bringing oxygen-rich blood, um, and the blood flows from those sinusoids to the central vein and back to the hepatic veins. Here's the big picture star. This this is just how you know we're we're moving blood and the exchange between the cells is happening. But this is really what I want to you to focus on. Bile flows from the ductules to the hepatic ducts and then to the common hepatic duct. So this is um, where we're we're making bile now. These are just showing all the lobes. I don't really want you to focus on that. Okay. But so we're making bile. Um, you can see this little bitty bile duct here and all these branches. Um, let me think. I don't want to focus too much on the path of blood and bile in the hepatic lobule. So we're just going to move on. 
and talk about the importance of the liver. So it produces glycogen from glucose. Um, so it stores uh, glycogen or storage of sugar for energy. It breaks it also down. When we have low blood sugar, we can take glycogen from the liver and put it into glucose and release it into the blood. Uh, it can convert non-carbohydrates to glucose. So if you're eating an excessive amount of other things, it can change them to sugars. It oxidizes fatty acids. It makes lipoproteins, phospholipids, cholesterol. It uh, converts the excess carbs into protein and proteins into fat. Um, takes amino, amino group off amino acids. It forms urea. Oh my gosh, synthesizes plasma proteins, converts amino acids to other amino acids, stores glycogen, as we mentioned. Um, it stores iron, a bunch of vitamins. It has phagocytosis going on. It removes toxins from the blood. It acts as a blood reservoir because of all the vascular tissue. And the main thing we're talking about now is its role in digestion to secrete bile. And so that is um, really what I wanted you to, to know, that the, the liver is what makes bile. So let's see if there's anything here we need. If cancer spreads to your liver, life can continue only weeks to months. It's so important to your health. Um, you can get a piece of someone's litter, liver and it does regenerate. Um, Cool information, not for our test. So let's, this is what we want to focus on is what is bile? Um, so it's this yellow green liquid, liquid from hep hepatic cells, remember hepatic, hepatocytes. And so they're constantly secreting this bile. So bile is mainly water, it's liquid, but it has a bunch of bile salts. And their job is to emulsify fats. So they kind of break fat from big fat structures into smaller fat structures. Um, and, and that's the only really digestive function. It has some bile pigments like bilirubin, biliverdin, all from hemoglobin. Um, it has cholesterol in it, it has electrolytes in it. Hopefully you've learned about jaundice before. Jaundice is an issue, usually some disease associated with the liver like cirrhosis or hepatitis and you are not able to break down the bilirubin. And um, we see this in children, right? And they go sit them in front of a billy light because UV does break down bilirubin. So hepatitis is, a, hepatitis is inflammation of the liver. There's a bunch of different types and they vary in their severity. Um, often, most often it's due to a virus and they can be symptomless, right? Some are bloodborne. I have a close family member that had um, a blood transfusion back in the late 70s, early 80s, before, before 1982, and they started testing blood and they contracted hepatitis from that blood transfusion. So there's hepatitis A. This is transmitted by contact with food or objects contaminated with feces containing the virus. Hepatitis B, transmitted by contact with body fluids containing the virus. Hepatitis C, transmitted through blood contact. Um, half of all known cases are hepatitis C, so that is the one that my um, person that I love has. So what the crap is the gallbladder? It's this little bitty pear-shaped sac, inferior surface of the liver. It has a cystic duct. Um, it's the only entry and exit duct of the gallbladder, and it merges with that hepatic duct and form what's called the common bile duct. And what its job, like any bladder, it's for storage. So bile isn't made in the gallbladder, it's made in the liver, but it is stored here in the gallbladder. So that is something to correct in your mind. If you ever thought gallbladder makes bile, uh, no ma'am, no sir, it stores it. And that's where bile can just get concentrated. It is actually created right in the liver like we just learned. So it releases bile into the duodenum of the small intestine through the bile duct at the hematopancreatic ampulla where those come together. There is a sphincter that regulates the bile being released into the duodenum. And I'm sure you've heard about gallstones. So the gallbladder normally concentr uh, concentrates these bile salts and those pigments and cholesterol but sometimes the cholesterol precipitates and it forms these crystals and those can enlarge and that's called a gallstone. Excess, 
bile concentration is one cause. Too much cholesterol release is another. Inflammation of your gallbladder is another. And it's all um, regulated by uh, cholecystokinin, which is a hormone. And so here you can see a gallbladder with the gallstones in green. And the regulation of bile released by CCK, not important for us. So what does these bile salts do? They help in digestion through emulsification, which is, like I mentioned, the break of a large fatty globula into smaller ones. And then you have more surface area for the lipase to work. And so it's going to help in absorption of your fatty acids and cholesterols by forming these little mycelies, these tiny droplets of fat. And, um, of course, helps fat-soluble vitamins like A, D, and, a, D E, and K be absorbed. And almost all of these salts are um, recyclable. So you can have some gallbladder disease, and um, symptoms would be pain and nausea and sweating. There are some tests. You would look at an x-ray, or um, and, and you're looking for these like gallstones. And then treatment, you can remove the gallstone or do endoscopy to find them and remove them from certain areas. So here are some hormones of the digestive tract, where they come from and what they do, how they control digestion, in other words. So in the small intestine, we have left this pyloric sphincter, which um, sent that acid kind from the stomach into the duodenum. And it's going to go all the way till you get to the large intestine. It fills up a lot of the abdominal cavity. This is what you think of when you think of intestines, all those long tubes. And they're getting that, like I mentioned, the chyme from the stomach. And they're getting all these secretions from the pancreas and, and from the liver or from the gallbladder if it you know was stored there. And this is where complete digestion of the nutrients happen. And this is where most of the absorption is going to occur. And anything that wasn't absorbed, the remaining trash is sent on to the large intestine. Now, there are three parts of your small intestine. The first part, which we've mentioned a lot, is the duodenum. And then the jejunum is the middle, thicker, more active part. And then the ileum is the distal part. And that's where we find those Peyer's patches. And Peyer's patches we talked about are these lymphatic nodules that increase as you go down the ileum. And what they're doing is they're uh, masses of um, immune cells and, and phagocytes looking for bacteria because you're going to have some bacteria living in the larger intestines. And so this ileum is getting really close to that. So you have these pyre patches um, start to show up. The jejunum and the ileum are suspended by some folds of your peritone peritoneum called the mesentery and it has lymph and blood vessels and nerves um, that attach to the intestine wall so it's kind of like a sheet hanging it up. The double fold of that peritoneum is called the greater omentum. It drapes down over the stomach and over the large intestine and so here you can kind of see this mesentery that has all this vascular nerve and lymphatic stuff um, and so it's kind of hanging on and suspending the small intestine. And so you can see here's the stomach and we go through the sphincter to the duodenum and then once you're getting suspended you know you're at jejunum and this is the majority of it and you get down here to the ileum and you're headed to the large intestine. And so here's kind of um, some pictures and you can see this greater omentum, this like drape if you will, <laughs> covering up the, the intestines. So there are tiny projections of the mucosa called intestinal villi, and it's all about surface area. Remember, in the stomach, we had little creases or whatever, but that was to distend the stomach. This is for surface area. This is for absorption. Small intestine, write this down. This is where absorption happens. This is the major place of digestion. It is the, it's the digestive club, okay? So each of these little villi, uh, villi is plural, so villus is singular, has simple column epithelial with some connective tissue, lots of blood vessels because we need to absorb all these nutrients. Um, lacteals are there for lymphatic capillary absorption. 
of fats, and then there's nerve fibers, of course. And then on these epithelial cells contain microvilli, so even more surface area for more absorption. And you have these glands or crypts that are located at the bases, and plaque circularis are these um, circular folds of the mucosa, which also increase surface area. So lots of increased surface area happening. And so you can look in the small intestine and you see, uh, here's like a little gland, but you see this one villa. So all these villi, and then if you zoom in on the villi, even these cells, these uh, columnar epithelial cells have microvilli for increased surface area. And there's one of those cells there. So lots of surface area. Isn't that a cool picture with all the organelles inside? And the plaque circularis are even more folds. And so you've got these ring looking structures. Um, it is all about absorption and digestion here in the small intestine. So what secretions are being released in the small intestines? Well, there's like water and mucus and a bunch of enzymes to do this digestion. So mucus secreted by glob glob goblet cells and it's alkaline mucus. We're just make, protecting our small intestines. Um, and of course we want this to be flu uh, fluid structure so things are moving um, well in our small intestines. And then the enzymes Look at all these ACEs. So ACE means enzyme. Peptidase, what did I tell you about peptid? Think of proteins. This is breaking down proteins. So all our other enzymes, protein enzymes like trypsin and pepsin and all of those, they broke huge proteins down into polypeptides. Well, the peptidases are now taking those peptides and breaking them into monomers called amino acids. Sucrase breaks down sucrose, maltase breaks down maltose, lactase breaks down lactose, breaking down all those disaccharides into monomers, the monosaccharides. And then lipase breaks down the fatty acids, uh, fats into fatty acids and glycerol. So lots of enzymes. Um, what are we breaking down? We're breaking down protein, sugar, and fat. So wow, here is the summary of the major digestive enzymes from the mouth all the way down. Um, and then like where they come from and what they do. So what regulates the small intestine secretion? Um, it's response to mechanical stimulation. So this, this movement um, happening as chyme uh, stimulates the goblet cells to secrete more mucus because we know that acidic material is coming. So we need to protect ourselves. Um, as the wall is distended, it activates nerves in the small intestine, and that's going to trigger intestinal enzyme to be released as well as peristalsis. So what's happening in the small intestine? We said a lot of digestion and a lot of absorption, and it's really the name of the game here, again, is surface area. It's, um, I mean, so much of it is absorbed, very little just keeps going. So it says carbohydrate digestion absorption. Salivary pancreatic amylase break down the starch into glycogen and into the little disaccharides. Your intestinal enzymes break down those disaccharides into the monosaccharides, and those are absorbed by diffusion into the blood through the villi. Protein digestion, pepsin in the stomach breaks down proteins into polypeptides, and then you have your pancreatic proteases that break down proteins into polypeptides, and then in the intestines, we have the peptidases breaking the peptides into the even smaller pieces of amino acids, which are absorbed through the villi. And so this is just showing the chemistry of like a disaccharide, uh, maltose, um, and the enzyme maltase taking this maltose and breaking it down into two monosaccharides, in this case, glucose. And then uh, a dipeptide, two amino acids being broke down into two amino acids by an enzyme. Fat digestion absorption, so remember we have emulsified by the bile salts and digested by, from pancreatic and small intestine enzymes um, into glycerol and fatty acids, and then those absorbed um, through the lacteals, the actual lymphatic capillaries of the villi. The mycelies, um, remember those little bitty fatty acids in the bile salts that they can migrate to the microvilli and those are also absorbed. And then new triglyceride clusters are encased in a protein called um, chylomicrons, and those are absorbed also by the lacteals. And so here you see uh, this glycerol and the three fatty acids, and with lipase, 
breaks it down into the separate three fatty acids and glycerol. And this is just showing like uh, the cliomicrons and fatty acids being absorbed um, through the, the lacteals and, and in the um, epithelial tissue. And so this is how the intestine absorbs these nutrients. So how are we moving things? Well, it's through peristalsis, of course, that um, propelling movement of milking things down the small intestine, and also segmentation, because you've got some ring-like movements going on. The parasympathetic impulses are, are stimulating this, and your ileocecal sphincter joins the ileum of the small intestine to the cecum of the large intestine, and so that's what's controlling the movement from the small intestine to the large intestine which leads us to the large intestine. Um, not named because it's actually longer or more important, it's just greater in diameter. It's only 1.5 meters long, uh, pretty short compared to our large intestine. But um, it does, it is eventually, you know, it is important, um, but it's not named by the length, but by the diameter. Its main job is to absorb the water and electrolytes. So we've taken all the proteins, the nucleic acids, the nucleotides, the glycerols, the carbohydrates, the amino acids, the fat, everything's taken out, all we have left is the water. And so um, that's what we're going to do, we're going to make feces here, right? So there are parts of the large intestine. There's the cecum, the colon, um, the rectum, and then the anal canal. And so usually when people talk about the large intestine, they're talking about the colon. And the rectum is gonna lead us to the anal canal, which has sphincters to guard the anus. So here are the parts of the large intestine. So here's this ileum, right? So we're gonna have a, a ileocecal, ileum, cecum, sphincter that controls the movement all that's really left is waste, water, and electrolytes. And so this um, comes in here and um, goes through, you know, it's kind of a frame around the small intestines are going to be here. And it goes through this ascending colon, that means go up, transverse colon, go across, descending colon, go down. Um, you see all these bulbous structures, they're called hostra. They do increase the surface area a little bit to, of course, increase absorption. Your sigmoid col colon, because it kind of makes an S shape. And then you get to your rectum and finally your anus. And so here's a picture of the large intestines, rectum, and anal canal. So the wall is the same four layers as the elementary canal, because it is part of the elementary canal, but we don't have the villi, we don't have the placci circularis. We do have these bands of muscle that run the entire length of the, the colon, and they create these pouches called hostra, and that's going to help us form the feces. And so you can see um, the four layers and the lumen of the large intestines has little or no digestive function, but it still has these goblet cells. So we're still making secret, uh, mucus to um, lubricate really the feces that is forming uh, to leave. And this is where 90% of your water is being absorbed back into your blood. Uh, it does have intestinal flora. So these are bacteria, uh, some types of E. coli are here that are gonna break down cellulose because we don't have cellulase, you know, we don't have that enzyme, <laughs> um, but they do. So they can break down some cellulose for us. We call that fiber. And they also produce vitamins for us. So these bacteria are important. Um, I worry about people who take a broad spectrum antibiotic because it can kill the intestinal flora and then you have some digestive issues. Eventually, the purpose of the large intestine, absorb water electrolytes, form feces, and defecate. You might have some little intestinal gas due to mainly the bacteria in your intestinal flora and what they're eating, and that's where that unpleasant odor comes from. And so here you can see the goblet cells making the mucus to move the feces on through. Um, the movements are similar to that of the small intestines. They are gonna be a little bit slower, and we have mass movements of peristaltic waves 
uh, which usually follows a meal, and then there's the defecation reflex, which actually eliminates feces from your body. It in <laughs> it's weird to think about. It involves holding your uh, a deep breath and then contracting your abdominal muscles. That moves your feces into your rectum, and then peristaltic waves kind of do the rest for you. So what is feces? It is anything that was not digested and absorbed, and it's going to be um, usually water, electrolytes, some mucus, some bacteria, and the bile pigments um, that were altered by bacteria. And it's all due to bacteria because of this odor. There are disorders of the large intestines like divert diverticulosis um, and then inflammatory bowel disease, uh, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, colorectal cancer, um, the fourth most common cancer in the United States. So we need to be aware and um, proactive on that. And then there's all the lovely life change, life changes that happen as you get older with your digestive system. So for this week, you should listen to the lectures and do the practice on the digestive system. No lab this week.